my name is Non Witzleb. I'm the chair of the Obligations Lab Asia, which is a um, research cluster of the Center for Comparative and Transnational Law here at CUHK Law. Uh, it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome you all tonight for a seminar by Dr. Jeevan Hariharan, who is an assistant professor at Queen Mary University of London. The Jeevan's full bio is uh, on the events page, so I can just limit myself to saying that he has degrees from the University of Sydney, from Cambridge University, and most recently uh, from uh, University College London. And he wrote his doctoral thesis on issues of physical privacy. So he is uh, the perfect speaker tonight for our seminar. And I uh, welcome him. Um, the, the, the presentation will be for about 45 minutes. And then there'll be an opportunity for Q&A. So if you have any questions for Jivan, please put them in the chat for us uh, so that I can pose those questions to him. Okay, Jivan, um, do you want to share your slides? Yeah, I will. I will do just some, um, just a moment. I'll share those there. And oh no, I will stop that sharing. I'll share the screen. Okay, and I'll move it up to there. Wonderful. Hopefully. You can see them. You can see them? Yes, over to you. Really looking forward to your presentation. Great. Uh, well, thank you so much for um, for the kind invitation to, to come and, um, and, and speak today. Um, just at the start, I wanted to, to thank Professor Witzleb for um, allowing me to, to speak about this, this topic. And I also wanted to thank all of you um, for taking the time to, to, to come along. And it's great to see so many, um, so many people interested um, in, this, in this case. Um, so as, um, as Professor Witzleb says, the, uh, the subject of my, my talk today is the UK Supreme Court's decision in Fern and Tate Gallery. Uh, a case about the operation of a viewing gallery at the Tate Modern in central London, looking into looking into the claimant's luxury flats. Now, I'm sure many of you here today will have some awareness of the of the decision. Might have might have heard about this this case. In my view, it, it's one of the most significant tort law and indeed private law decisions that the court has handed down in in recent years. Uh, the significance of the decision, I think, comes from the fact that not, not just that it deals with, say, subject matter that's headline grabbing and that's easy to talk about with, with friends um, down at a pub or otherwise. Uh, it's a decision which, in my view, tells us important things about a number of number of issues. Those include the protection of personal privacy, uh, the nature of property rights, planning system and the interaction between human rights and, and private law. So it's a decision that has relevance in a number of different areas. And I think that that's why, amongst other things, the case has generated, generated so much interest. It's impossible, I think, to talk through every issue that this fascinating litigation raises. So instead, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to divide my talk into three main parts. To start with, I thought that it would be useful to provide you all with a bit of background to my research so that you can see that the perspective that I'm coming on, coming from when I, when I look at this case and the lens through which I'm analysing a decision like this. The second uh, thing that I thought I'd do today is provide a recap of the decision in, in Fern. So I know that people here will probably have varying levels of understanding and knowledge of the case. I don't want to spend too long on this, but at the same time, I thought it would be helpful to work through uh, what the court decided in, in, in the case itself. And then third, and this is, this is the substantive part of the presentation, I wanted to draw out three key points from the decision, focusing particularly on what Fern means for, for privacy law. So the first point that I'm going to talk about here in this part of the presentation is what Fern means for privacy protection via the tort of private nuisance. The 
Second point that I'm going to talk about is what FERN means for privacy protection by other causes of action. And then the third and final point that I'm going to talk about is what FERN tells us about common law development in privacy cases. Um, I'll then end with a little bit of a recap of where we are today, and then I'll turn over and, and there'll be some time for, for questions. So the first part of the presentation, which is some background to my research and, and my work in the area. So I'm a private lawyer and I work primarily in tort law and, and privacy. And my PhD, which, which as Professor Witzler mentioned, which is at UCL, was on the protection of physical privacy in English law, sometimes known as intrusion-based privacy interferences. And I'm currently about to start working uh, this PhD project into, into what I think is the first standalone book on this, on this subject, uh, at, least in, in, at least in English law. Now, in terms of the topic itself, here's, here's what physical privacy is and where this topic, topic comes from. And you'll see in a bit how this is connected to, to the Fern and Tate Gallery case quite, quite directly. Privacy is a hot topic these, these days. With the rise of big tech in particular, I think we all hear about this term privacy all the time especially in relation to our activities online. We're constantly thinking about, say, cookies and, and the tracking of us online. Uh, and all through our day-to-day -day activities, where we're constantly hearing this word privacy come up and personal privacy be a, be a concern. But if one looks at the mainstream discussion around online privacy, both in the news and elsewhere, the impression that one gets is that privacy is almost entirely about the protection of data and information about ourselves. We're always thinking about privacy these days, primarily in data-based terms, about protection of personal data and information. Now, that happens to be the position in most legal systems as well. So in English law, which is the primary focus of my area of research, Many people would say that at long last, there's been some meaningful forms of privacy protection. And there's two in particular that emerge, have emerged in recent decades. First, there's a tort of misuse of private information that has, has developed in, in England and Wales. And second, there's data protection legislation, which in the UK is, you know, mirrors the system in, in, in Europe is the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, something that I'm, I'm sure many of you have heard of. But as those names suggest, the focus of those developments has almost been exclusively on data and information about the subject. And when we look at a number of other jurisdictions as well, we see that data and informational focus running very strongly through the way that we think about personal privacy and the protection of personal privacy. What my research does and what where my work comes from is it pushes against this narrow informational approach. And what I seek to do is to bring out other aspects of privacy. And the particular aspect of privacy that I focus the most on is an aspect of privacy that some scholars have called physical privacy. So the thought is this. Whereas informational privacy is concerned with the unauthorized collection and use of information and data about ourselves, physical privacy is a different concept. What it is concerned with is unauthorized sensory intrusions, watching, listening, or otherwise sensing us without consent. Now, physical and informational privacy may be at stake in the same scenario, but perhaps the paradigm example of a physical privacy breach is, say, someone looking at you in the shower or someone, yes, yeah, so looking at you um, when, when, you're, when you're in the shower. 
here, the idea is that the nub of the concern is that you are being watched without permission. The nub of the concern is not necessarily that the perpetrator is misusing information about you. And so it's a distinct aspect of privacy that's at stake. Now, there's some very difficult questions concerned with the topic of, of physical privacy. One of them, which you may be thinking about right now, is the extent to which these two things are really distinct and the way in which they, they overlap with each other. There's difficult questions about, say, the normative boundaries of, of physical privacy on the one hand and informational privacy on the other. And then to the extent that we think that they're different, there's difficult questions about how the law should respond to physical privacy interferences distinct from informational ones. And my PhD sought to, to answer those, those questions. It sought to uh, explore those issues of what physical privacy is, how it differs from other aspects of privacy, and also how the law should respect, how the law should protect it. Now, very interestingly, all through my time working on that that project, which which came to an end uh, early early last year, in the background sat the firm litigation. So this was a case that. Uh, the High Court decision was around when I was first interviewing for PhD positions, and my viva coincided with, just about coincided with the Supreme Court judgment in that case. It took a long time to wind its way up through the court hierarchy here in England and Wales, but it's kind of a paradigm example as well of, of a fact scenario that engages physical privacy issues. And so it was interesting that that decision was there throughout, throughout my research on the topic. And that research culminated in some sense with a note that I wrote on the, on, on the case, which was, um, which is published in Modern Law Review. And if you're looking for a fuller explanation of some of the, um, the points that I'm talking about there, I'd refer you to that, that case note, which is available early access at the moment on the, on the Modern Law Review website and, and will be forthcoming in print in a, in a forthcoming, forthcoming issue. So that's the perspective that I come at the firm litigation from. Let's talk about the Fern, Fern saga itself. So I don't want to spend too long on the facts of the decision, but I do think it might be helpful to just show you some photographs to illustrate exactly what went on in that, in, in this case. So as I said at the beginning, this was a claim that concerned the overlooking um, from the viewing platform of the Tate Gallery into the claimant's luxury, luxury flats. So on the left of screen, I've I've kind of got a, a zoomed out photo of the of the Tate Modern Gallery, which is here on um, the um, banks of, uh, of the Thames River, just just south of the river here in here in central London. And it's a typical London day there, and right right. Exact same weather as I see out the window at the moment. Um, quite grey and, and and cloudy. That's the that's the Tate Gallery, and you can see in the background of that that picture, you can see the Blavatnik Building, and that's the extension to the uh, the Tate Gallery where the the viewing platform is located. On the right hand side, you can you can see that Blavatnik Building in fuller fuller view, and right at the top of that underneath underneath the the kind of top of the Blavatnik building that's where the the viewing gallery sits the claimant's luxury flats are the building on on the right um, and that building is called called neo neo bank side so a couple more couple more photos so that we can we can visualize what's going on here on the on the left of of this, this side of presentations, we have the viewing gallery, which sits on level 10 of that, that Blavatnik building. Now, at the relevant time of the, the, the facts of this case, it offered panoramic views of, of London. So you could walk around that, view, that viewing gallery. You could see, say, some pools and the river out, out in front of you on one side, but then you could walk around the other side 
and you could see directly, say, into, into the luxury flats in Neo Bankside. And the distance between those two, two buildings and between the luxury flats and the buildings was incredibly, incredibly, um, in, incredibly short. Um, only 34, only 34 meters away. Now, one of the, the features of these luxury, luxury flats and the four luxury flat owners who were the claimants in this case were on the 13th to 21st floors of Neo Bankside was what was called a winter, a winter garden. Now, the winter gardens of these flats kind of form indoor balcony, they, they, they called them, and they had floor to ceiling um, windows. Now, this is not one of the winter gardens that's looking kind of onto the onto the Tate Gallery itself that I've um, that I've that I've put a shot of, of of here, but you can see what the winter garden kind of looks like. It, it it has floor to ceiling ceiling windows, and the claimants in in this case had flats where the winter garden kind of was completely visible from the the tenth floor of the um of the Blavatnik building viewing gallery. And on lookers used to come to that gallery, they used to uh, peer and, and, and watch the, the residents, and they also used to take photographs of, of the residents at different, at different points of, of, of time. And the residents who were said that they were clearly very um, distressed and upset, they, they brought a claim against the, the, the Tate Gallery. So those are the basic facts. What I want to talk about now is just how the case was how the case was pleaded. So being very upset at the crying that was going on from the tape, the residents went to the High Court and they sought injunctive relief. The case was pleaded in two ways. And one of the reasons why I mentioned this at the outset is that this way in which the case was pleaded initially sometimes gets lost in the subsequent uh, way that the case is analysed and, and talked about. So it's important to be clear about the way in which the claimants sought to bring their claim in the High Court, and it's a point that I'm going to come back to when I comment a little bit about the decision, little bit about the decision later on. So the first way that the case was pleaded was a direct claim was brought under the Human Rights Act here in the UK. And the Human Rights Act allows uh, individuals to bring claims against public authorities for violation of the European Convention of, of Human Rights. The relevant part of the European Convention of Human Rights that was relevant here was the right to private life, private and family life, home and correspondence that's protected by Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights. The UK Human Rights Act um, 1998 allows individuals to bring a claim against a public authority in um, domestic court for violation of that, that right. And so they, the claimant's first claim was to say that there had been a violation of their Article 8 rights in this, this case. The issue that this claim came down to in the High Court was whether the tape was properly understood as public authority for the purposes of those, that legislation. And the High Court, Justice Mann, decided that the tape was not a public or, or authority that the tape was not exercising public functions in the relevant sense that's required for it to be what's called a hybrid public authority in the case law, and as such, that because the tape was not a public authority, a direct claim couldn't be brought against it in human rights, human rights law and human rights legislation. That direct claim failed, and that direct claim was not subject to appeal at any point. So it was not something that was later looked at in the Court of Appeal decision in this case, nor in the nor in the Supreme Court's decision in this case. Second, and perhaps more more creatively, but 
very interestingly for our for our purposes today, the way that the claimants brought their case was they brought a case in private nuisance, tort of private nuisance. And specifically what the court said, uh, what the claimant said here, is that the Tate's use of their viewing gallery unreasonably interfered with the use and enjoyment of the art of the of, of their land. And so it was actionable as a as a, as a private nuisance. Now, what I've tried to do on the next slide is just set out how the nuisance claim was decided at each stage. And what we'll see here is that each of the High Court, Court of Appeal, Supreme Court, the majority and the minority uh, came to different views on two key questions. The first question that they had to consider on this private nuisance claim was whether overlooking or visual intrusion was even in principle actionable as a private nuisance. So private nuisance seems typically concerned with it's called physical interferences with the claimant's land, things like uh, even dirt, smoke, noise. And the question was whether visual intrusion, whether watching the, the, the claimants could constitute uh, an actionable private nuisance in principle. And then if so, the question was whether there was a private nuisance on the facts of these, these, this case. So in the High Court on the nuisance claim, Justice Mann said that in principle, the tort of private nuisance did extend to, to, to overlooking. He thought that that was a conclusion that was open to him on the basis that previous authorities were inconclusive. Um, so the one authority that might be against him there was an authority from the High Court of Australia in Victoria Park Racing and Taylor. Um, but that he was not bound by that decision, but if there was any doubt about that, that position, then he could develop the common law via the HRA, not through the direct aspect of the HRA, but via what's sometimes called the doctrine of indirect horizontal um, effect of the, the HRA. So he, he arrived at the position that the visual intrusion or overlooking was in principle actionable. But on the facts of these case, of, of this case, Justice Mann in the High Court said that this wasn't, um, the private nuisance claim wouldn't succeed in this case against the Tate Gallery. There was, he said, a material intrusion into the claimant's privacy, using that word in its ordinary sense, but that the Tate's use of land wasn't unreasonable in the sense that was required for the tort. And various factors were relevant to that, that assessment of reasonableness. And one of those factors included the availability of self-help remedies to the, uh, to the claimants, which included the use of curtains. A point that, that might come back to the end and, and, in, and questions as well, if you have any questions about that. Claimants appealed to the, to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal uh, uh, dismissed the appeal. So the claimants lost in the, in the Court of Appeal as well. But they lost on a very different different basis. The basis upon which they lost in the Court of Appeal was the court said that overlooking is not even in principle a, um, a, a, a private nuisance and that it can never constitute an actionable tort. And moreover, that the tort couldn't be extended via, um, via the HRA. And they came to this conclusion for a number of reasons. They uh, said that as a matter of precedent that this wasn't that this wasn't permissible. Um, finding cases like Victoria Park Racing from Australia um, um, authoritative, but they also said that there were policy reasons that it was difficult to draw the line in overlooking cases compared to say emanations from smoke and and um, smoke and, and noise. And additionally, they said that planning law is a better mechanism for, for dealing with overlooking type problems. And that really what's going on here is that this is a claim about the claimant's privacy, whereas nuisance is about property rights. So they said that that shoehorning wasn't permissible. Either. And because it, it not even principled could constitute a nuisance, there was no nuisance. Uh, they didn't have to look at the question of whether there was a nuisance in the facts of this case. 
Remarkably, um, the claimants appealed to the Supreme Court, who a majority of whom allowed the allowed the appeal. But in a three to two decision, both the majority and the minority of the Supreme Court um, disagreed with the, the Court of Appeal and thought that visual intrusions are actionable as a as a private nuisance. Both the majority and minority thought that visual intrusions are in principle actionable. The majority was particularly firm on that point. Lord Leggett, who wrote the majority decision, said that there are no conceptual or a priori limits on what can constitute a private nuisance at all. What you're looking at is whether it materially impacts the use of use and enjoyment of the claimant's land, and that anything which materially impacts on the use and enjoyment of the claimant's land is actionable. The minority said that the visual intrusions of the type that occurred here are clearly, clearly actionable. And Lord Sales wrote the, wrote the minority decision. Where the majority and minority differed was whether there was a nuisance on the facts of this case. Majority, what the majority said was that the core question is whether there is a substantial interference with the ordinary use of the claimant's land. Um, and they unpacked that, that notion of ordinary use of, of land was, was critical to the Supreme Court's decision. They said that here, the Tate's liability using that test was entirely straightforward. They said that it wasn't even a, a difficult, difficult case. What the majority thought is that the High Court and Court of Appeal had both been motivated in their decision by the public interest in, in, in the viewing gallery operating, but that public interest was not something that was relevant to liability in a nuisance claim. It was only something that could be taken into account at the stage of remedies in working out whether to view damages in lieu of an injunction. My minority, Lord Sales, uh, whilst he thought that the visual intrusions were actionable in principle, uh, he thought that there wasn't a private nuisance on the facts of this case. And in this respect, Lord Sales' judgment very much mirrored what Justice Mann had said initially in the High Court. Uh, so Lord Sales emphasised that nuisance is about reasonable reciprocity and compromise within between neighbours and said that the Supreme Court's decision, uh, sorry, the High Court at first instance, the trial judge's analysis of that, of, of that, um, of those facts, uh, of the law to the facts in this case, could not be, could not be uh, faulted. So that's, that's the decision it, itself. What I'm going to spend the rest of the presentation, the next 15 minutes or so talking about, is three key points of, in focusing in particular on what FERN means for, pri uh, for privacy law. So I'm going to start by talking about what FERN means for privacy protection via the tort of, uh, of private nuisance. The main point that I want to draw out, um, draw out here is just how expansive the Supreme Court's decision is in this area. So in much of the literature on private nuisance, say private prior to the decision, and indeed, in commentary after the decision, it was thought that nuisance was a tort that required some sort of physical interference with the land itself. Generally, the physical interference would be in the form of an emanation which crossed the boundary from the defendant's land to the claimant's land, whether that be something like tree roots, whether it be smoke or whether it be, whether it be noise. What we see in the Supreme Court's decision is a real decentering of that concept of physical interference in nuisance law. The majority judgment in particular, as I say, emphasizes that a nuisance can be caused by any means whatsoever and that there's absolutely no conceptual or a priori limits on what's actionable. That means in principle that absolutely any privacy interference is actionable as a private nuisance, 
so long as it can be understood or framed as an interference with the claimant's use and enjoyment of, of land. Now, I, sh I should say that my own, my own view is that I think that this is quite a positive aspect of the, of the, of the decision. I certainly don't agree with with all of what the court says says in in Fern, and um, and if you read um, if you if you read the note that I wrote in the decision, you'll see that if anything, my my allegiance lies say more with uh, Justice Mann at, at, at first instance and, and Lord Sales in the minority in the Supreme Court, but I think that what this part of the majority's decision does. Uh, very helpfully is that it aligns nuisance with its normative underpinnings. So we say that nuisance is a tort where the interest protected is the use and enjoyment of someone's someone's property. The physical interference concept is one that's always struck me as being quite artificial and that it's a concept that's almost stretched to the point of absurdity when when people are saying that noise or or even affronting sights that as has been said before could be seen as a as a physical inter interference. I think that the Supreme Court reasoning here also puts to bed some of the difficult reasoning that we've seen from the Court of Appeal about nuisance being an inappropriate avenue to bring this case because what the residents really complained about was their privacy not their property what the supreme court does is it uh rightly dismisses any notion that privacy and property rights are somehow mutually exclusive as english courts seem to have recognized for some time now there's a wide panoply of actions that protect our privacy some of those are based around land um, others are not based based uh, around um, land and, and they all come together to, to protect personal privacy in, in, in one way or another it's a patchwork patchwork system now in terms of what this decision might mean for privacy cases in in the future what we see is that the supreme court in this case is very particular is very careful to narrow the judgment to this to the particular facts that occurred they said that it's not overlooking in the ordinary course that would be actionable, but that the visual intrusions here were particularly egregious because many thousands of people were being invited to the Tate each year to look out in all directions, including to the claimant's funds. But I think that the judgment can clearly form the basis for nuisance cases in, in privacy cases to, to come. If I was to speculate here, I think that the first group of cases where you might see uh, this decision being used in privacy cases in, might involve, say, home security devices that are used for surveillance. So, for example, there was a case over here that was decided before the Supreme Court decision, but after the Court of Veal decision called Fairhurst and Woodard, where the claimant was being spied on being spied on using multiple Amazon ring uh, ring type devices and that claim whilst it succeeded on other basis on harassment legislation and data protection legislation it failed and on private nuisance on the basis of the court of appeal authority you might see a case like that being being reopened in some way if those facts were to come up again in the future on the basis of the supreme court decisions more more tentatively i wonder whether a defendant um whether what we might see in the future is some pressure being put on the idea that the defendant in the nuisance case necessarily needs to be a neighbor so if it's the case that a nuisance claim can be brought on the basis that it's a material interference with the claimant's use and enjoyment of land there might be pressure put on the idea that that interference needs to come from a person on the adjoining adjoining land and so a question might arise about whether nuisance could now be the basis for holding, say, big tech to account for tracking in, in, in homes. That's something that we might, might see in the future. I just point out, though, that one of the limits of privacy protection through private nuisance in physical privacy type, type cases is that no matter how expansive the law gets on the law of private nuisance, um, at least as presently understood, and the Supreme Court really confirmed this in this decision, 
nuisance is a tort to land. And so it's crucial that the claimant has a proprietary interest in that land, usually, usually exclusive possession, in order to, to sue. And so you might see an imbalance going forward in the level of privacy protection that's offered to claimants for physical privacy breaches where they happen on their own land that they own versus versus else, elsewhere. And that's something that I think is going to be very important to explore in, in future cases as well. So that's the that's the first first point of comment. The second point that I want to talk about is I want to talk about what private nuisance might mean for other causes of action. And really what I want to do here is I want to put in your heads the idea that the claimants were able to achieve a remarkable level of protection for their privacy by framing this case as an interference with their property rights. And that that might be important for the way in which we think about where, the way that privacy law fits together. Now, in order to access this point, I think it just might be helpful for us to go back and consider what the claimants were faced with when they made this claim in the first place. Now, it's very interesting that this case wasn't, say, pleaded in the tort and misuse of private information or, or data protection law or, or anything like, like that. And it's quite interesting that that human rights claim fell away from the decision very early on in that, that litigation. Because what we see as this case moves up through the court system and as the focus becomes very exclusively on the tort of private nuisance, that the claimants were able to achieve a very, very high level of protection. And one of the reasons I think for this is that they were able to cut out public interest, say, from the liability analysis in, in a nuisance case. So in all of these other causes of action, particularly if you're looking at a direct claim under human rights legislation, there's going to be some balancing exercise at the liability stage between privacy rights and, and, and the rights of the de defendant, the pub public interest. Similarly, in data protection law, misuse of private information, you're going to see that balancing exercise occur very, very strongly. And so nuisance because of the particular way that this case was framed and because of the way that the Supreme Court reasons in the decision focusing on material interference with the order, common ordinary use of land that it's a very very um uh, it, it's a decision that's that's kind of offers a very high level of protection and so I wonder whether we've talked about a patchwork of privacy protection in this jurisdiction and elsewhere, I wonder whether we're going to see some kind of hierarchy of decisions, uh, privacy protections emerge, where claimants, at least in their homes, are really going to look at nuisance in the first instance. I also want to flag a point here about whether Fern opens up any new routes for privacy protection, um, which might flow from the idea that New, this decision really decenters uh, physical interference. And so I wonder whether we might see a similar sort of decentering occur in, in other areas of, of tort law. To an extent, I think that we've already seen that going back before Fern to a Supreme Court decision on false imprisonment called, called Jallo. This was a decision concerning electronic tagging. Um, and in that case, you saw a decentering of physical interference for the tort of false imprisonment, insofar as the court said that the focus on false imprisonment is on the claimant not being able to move in different directions, not necessarily that the um, tort is made out through the imposition of physical barriers. And so, I wonder whether what we might see is claimants putting pressure on physical interference in other areas, perhaps to, to achieve higher levels of privacy protection. And one scenario that you might see that occur um, is, say, the law of, of, of battery, which um, has always been typically understood as requiring touching or physical interference. Might we see some, some pressure on the idea that a battery necessarily requires a touching such that extreme or visual or sensory intrusions an activity like a strip search might be might be able to be brought within the ambit of a battery law. So the final point that I want to talk about is what 
Byrne tells us about the court's changing approach to common law development. And the point that I make here is that what um, Fern does, in, in my view, is that it signals a decreasing reliance on human rights legislation to develop privacy protection. Now, what we'd seen in, in, in the past is English privacy law protection being famously lacking, but then the court over here developing privacy protection um, relying in part on human rights legislation, such as the, the Human Rights Act, and that indirect horizontal effect of that legislation that I that I referred to, to earlier. And that's the way that the courts developed the tort of misuse of private information over here from breach of confidence. In Fern, however, if you look at both the majority and the minority's decision in the Supreme Court, there's a focus on the ECHR and the HRA being uh, an unnecessary complication and distraction when looking at the scope of a private law claim and when looking at the scope of, of the tort of private nuisance. In fact, what we see is that the decision is not framed as any extension of the law whatsoever, merely an application of, of existing, existing principles. Um, I've written a blog post last year on the um, the UK constitutional law blog, which says a little bit more about this this point and the way that we see a decentering, uh, a shift in the the court's approach to horizontal effect um, revealed in a decision like like Fern. Um, the the last point that I that I'd make um, under this this heading is that. I, and, I, and I offer this thought quite tentatively, and, and I'd be interested if any of you have any thoughts on this, is the question of what, what this decision might mean for other, other jurisdictions. Now, I've been looking at privacy for, for a while and privacy in jurisdictions, at different jurisdictions. One of the things that I've learned is to be somewhat cautious about extrapolating what's happening in privacy law from one jurisdiction to, to another. But Arguably, the decreased reliance on human rights legislation opens the door to a claim like this being pursued elsewhere. And Australia might just be one potential example of that. So as I, as I mentioned earlier, there's a high court decision, Victoria Park Racing and Taylor, which often is seen as standing in the way of a decision like this in Australia because it appears to hold that, that Overlooking in that case, in that case, into a into a racetrack could not constitute a private nuisance. But the Supreme Court in Fern is keen to distinguish that case, saying that it was it was a case about the profitability of the business that was at issue there, not, not say a visual intrusion like this into, into a residential home. So there's a question that's open about the way in which we might see this legislation of this this type of decision being relied on relied on in other jurisdictions and as i said i'd be i'd be interested in people's thoughts on that um i just just before i turn over to questions the very final thing that i thought that i'd mention is is where are we now in this de decision you might just be wondering what the um what the current state of play is uh, we haven't had a further decision in the Fern and Tate Gallery saga because after the Supreme Court decision, the case was actually remitted down to the High Court to determine what the remedy should be. Should there be um, an injunction or damages in lieu of one which would depend in part in the public interest in the viewing gallery operating there? We haven't had a further decision in the case since then, but what has happened since is that the viewing gallery has partially reopened. Um, and so this is just a screenshot from the Tate's web website, and I've, I've been to the Tate recently, and basically what's happened is that the viewing gallery remains open on, on one side, but you can't walk, walk over to the side that um, looks over onto the Neobank side flats. So that's where we are at the, at the moment in this, this case. So that's what, what I wanted to say today in the in, in the substantive part of the presentation. I really look forward to, to any questions that you have. And again, thanks so much for, for having me here today to uh to speak to all of you. 
All right. Thank you very much, Stephen. That was uh, wonderfully clear, you know, the exposition of the law and all, not only of the case, but also what it means. Uh, and we surely have to think about also what its effect might be in, in Hong Kong. So probably we, we come to that. I've got two questions first uh, from audience members that uh, are so like more about uh, different issues. So the first one is for my, my colleague, um, Professor Stuart Hargreaves. Uh, you know, he asked whether, you know, so you mentioned earlier that you think a potential application of, of the law in the future might be uh, where, where home security devices are used for surveillance. Um, so who, who would be the potential defendant there? Would it be the person that, are, you, the, that is using the device? Or do you think there could also be claims against uh, big tech companies themselves? So um, it's, it's a really interesting, interesting question. And it, it might be worth me backing up and saying just a tiny bit about that Fairhurst and Woodard County Court decision. So that was a case where it was a an individual defendant who had set up various home security devices um, from, from his home and it kind of looked into his neighbor's home and it was eventually found to be that, that the use of all of those cameras amounted to a harassing course of conduct and also that there was a data protection law breach. But as I said, the court said that it couldn't be a nuisance claim because visual intrusion con couldn't constitute a nuisance. So I think in the first instance, what you might see is a decision like that going against, say, an individual perpetrator for using those devices. Now, the question is whether over time the claim could be brought against uh, the even, say, manufacturer of that device against the tech company itself. That's an open question, but the point that I want to, to flag there is that if you read the Supreme Court's decision, the majority judgment in particular, there is nothing in principle which appears to be preventing that sort of claim being brought because of the way that the court is focusing on the fact that there are no conceptual or a priori limits on what is actionable in principle. So whether or not we see such a claim or not in the future, that's an open question whether that, that's quite fetched or far-fetched, I, I, I don't know. But the thought that I'd, I'd leave you with is that if you look at the Supreme Court's decision itself, there is nothing in principle which appears to prevent such a claim. Hmm. Yeah, no, that, that makes perfect sense. And it's, I guess it's, it's also, you know, the, the other point that you made, uh, that it, nuisance is, you know, no longer just between neighbours, you know, it could be anyone who's potentially a, a defendant. And, uh, you know, so it's as long as you basically uh, you know, committing the interference. So, okay. Yeah, that's, that's... yeah totally. So, so the one point that I'd, I'd make on that as well, um, just, just really briefly, because it's, it's a point that I, that I didn't have time to mention in the, in the presentation is that, um, quite a while ago in, in the nineties, you had a case Conradian and Bush, which was a case where a private nuisance claim was actually sought on the basis of telephone harassment. And in that case, um, there was a harassment claim, there was, sorry, a nuisance claim that was able to be brought where in that case, it, it appeared that the telephone harassment didn't necessarily come from a neighbour. In fact, there wasn't a, a, anything in the decision to say where actually the call was made from by, by the defendant. Mm -hmm. Now, Hunter and Canary Wharf overturned um, Conradian and Bush on, on the key point, which was whether in, in that case, it wasn't someone who was uh, the landowner that was making the claim in that case. It was the landowner's daughter. And so that case was overturned to the extent that they said that the claimant required a proprietary interest in order to make the claim. In the Supreme Court, we see a confirmation that's what, that those strict standing requirements hold. But you might see um, Conradian kind of come to the fore again in some notion that what's not required is the defendant being on, say, adjoining adjoining land, which is typically the case in nuisance cases. Yeah. Thank you, Raj. I've got I've got a few uh, follow on questions now. You know, so uh, one is from from Ray Song. He asked, "Would statutory law or regulation be more effective in dealing with big tech surveillance compared with a potential approach based on private nuisance?" 
Uh, and, and another question closely related to that, uh, would consent be a defense in that context? Um, so it's, um, they're both, they're both, um, both very interesting, interesting questions, which, as you say, are, are connected with, with each other. Um, the interaction between statute and on common law on, on privacy has a long history and it has, has a complicated history in, in part. So if you look back to uh, earlier decisions in the English context in particular, uh, there's a real reluctance on the parts of courts to develop any privacy protections partially on the basis that this is an area that it's apt for statute to step in, step in. And courts really saying, say, if you look at a decision like Kay and Robertson or something like, like, like that from the early 90s, that uh, this is an area that's right for parliamentary intervention, not, not the, the common law. What I suppose we've seen in, in recent years from the courts, and recent years, I mean, particularly in the last two, two decades, is the use of statute for, for sure coming to fall, particularly on the data protection side, but in other areas, say more of a willingness on courts to, to use, the, to, to use the, the common law. And the common law particularly being important in privacy cases, say in maybe a, a stop stopgap kind of fashion where it can offer, say, more comprehensive basis for dealing with with privacy interferences than maybe more specific types of legislation can have, particularly in the in English context, apart from the data protection side, where you might have seen legislation in the privacy context come up more and more recently, is actually on the criminal law side in looking at offences like, say, voyeurism or other activities, very, very narrow types of offences, whereas the common law is playing maybe a broader role in this, this area. So it might be the question of whether we can shoehorn big tech into one of those, um, say, more, a more prescribed type of legislation, or what happens is that the common law is always going to be pushed forward in a, in a more uh, broad and expansive way. Um, consent is certainly, certainly part of the, um, certainly part of the, um, the, the piece of the um, puzzle, puzzle here. Um, it would certainly come to the fore in, say, any, um, in, in any legislative regime about it. I suppose that the interesting point that I think about in terms of consent here uh, and the um, and the decision on the nuisance front and, and the interesting point of maybe tension here is the extent to which consent might come into play in interaction with the self-help remedies that the claimants could, mm -hmm. could offer. So the extent to which we think that the availability of curtains to the claimants here might represent some form of implicit consent to the type of to type of activities that that did occur. But but yeah, very very interesting points. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, maybe this is a good segue to talk about uh, you know what that case might mean for Hong Kong. You know, so Hong Kong is, yeah. I guess, stands somewhat between Australia and the UK because there is. Uh, human rights protection of privacy in in the Bill of Rights in Hong Kong, yeah. um, you know, unlike Australia, which doesn't have uh, you know Commonwealth protection um, at federal level, um, but Australia um, and Hong Kong coincide in not having a tort of misuse of private information. Um, so I was quite interested in how you say that, you know that. Tort didn't really, you know, that the privacy tort didn't really uh, feature much in the decision at all, you know, which is, I guess, you know, would be an encouraging sign for someone in Hong Kong who wanted to rely on um, Fern because it's quite standalone, really. Do you think this is a, a an, so like a, an accurate reading of the decision? No, it, it, it is, and I think that I, I I think that this point about where where you see I think privacy torts or privacy protections emerging in, in different jurisdictions, and this is the reason why I say that I think that we should be cautious about the way that we extrapolate from from jurisdiction to to jurisdiction on this issue, is that where privacy protections tend to emerge in different jurisdictions is in a standalone and circumscribed kind of kind of way. So 
many jurisdictions don't go down the route of, say, general privacy tort overarching protection. What we see is we see an informational tort of some sort emerge, and then perhaps different forms of protection for these physical privacy or, or intrusion-based privacy in interferences. So we've seen decisions come up in different contexts, some um, with, with different levels of, of human rights um, protection. So two jurisdictions where we've seen these, both of these torts kind of emerge are Canada and uh, New Zealand. Uh, in the UK, we have a misuse of private information tort, not a physical physical privacy one. And uh, in Australia at this stage, we have we have neither. So it's very interesting to hear that in Hong Kong, there isn't a misuse of private information tort, but there is the, the, the human rights protection. I certainly think that maybe the standalone way that this 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 has been over achieved over here might alert claimants to kind of similar circumscribed types of developments in their their jurisdiction relying on the particular frameworks that they have there. So I certainly think that there's a way of a way of way of doing that. I suppose the point that I'd I'd highlight is that this is the way that it's it's going to to happen in in in, in my likely view. It's going to happen through a circumscribed development of a tort like like private private nuisance uh, in a jurisdiction jurisdiction like this, not through some big overarching headline privacy claim. Okay, yes, that sounds uh, <clears throat> you know that sounds good. I feel like quite prescient, you know. So um, the, I've, I think we've only really got one more uh, you know uh, uh, time for one more question. Uh, Tiffany Tsan asked, um, would there be any residual claim against any public bodies for granting any necessary planning approvals for the Tate extension or for the failure to account for land use incom incompatibility for existing land use? So I guess it would be another, you know, is there another tort perhaps in the offing? That's a very interesting question. I have to, I have to admit, not one that I've that I've thought of sufficiently. But, but, um, so, so I'll have to have a think about that, and and I've written it down because it's um, it's a very interesting point. The one thing that I would I would uh say alert you to on this this point in the decision itself, and it's a difference between the Court of Appeal judgment and the Supreme Court judgment, is just the extent to which the Supreme Court here is pushing at the idea that the planning regime has an irrelevance to the way that the private nuisance claim was determined in this, this case. So mm -hmm. what we really see in this decision is the idea that planning permission cannot be used to cut down on the private law rights of the parties in this, in this case. And so what happens in planning law after this, I think, is a very, very interesting, interesting question. But on the nuisance side, it's it's remarkable the extent to which we see a um, uh, planning permission being pushed to one side in in, in the course of this di this decision. And as I say, it just kind of offers another dimension to how um, interesting the case is and and the way in which you'll see the decision unpacked from unpacked from different angles in the in the future. Wonderful. Thank you, Jivan, for, for all that insight, you know, for basically unpacking the decision for us. Uh, I'm sure we could uh, talk much longer, but our time is up, unfortunately. So, uh, you know, it's only, uh, you know, it's, I've only got time really to thank our audience for joining us today for the questions that you've asked. Mm -hmm.